see right now. Welcome everybody. Can you hear? Over to Ian now. Thanks, Sue. Very much. It's great to be back virtually, right? Best mm -hmm. we can do right now. Yes, definitely. I really enjoy giving this presentation in a uh, in a real setting, in a public setting, because it's really interactive. And I, I love to get people's feedback. I love to hear the, the answers to some of the questions that I pose. Um, this subject is as timely as I think uh, one could be given uh, where we live and the changes that are taking place in our environment. And one thing I can say right off the top is I, I assume many of you, I was sort of preaching to the choir, many of you have been taking advantage of more free time to get outside and enjoy nature. This is something that all of us at Mass Audubon have witnessed. There's people on the trails that have never been out before and you know when you see them. <laughs> you know, they may look like they haven't gotten out of the couch in a while or maybe their eyes are glaring because they, they just can't believe what they're seeing. I didn't know this sanctuary existed. A lot of those sorts of comments are coming back. So it's wonderful. This is one of the unanticipated benefits, I think, of the pandemic is it's really given people an opportunity to get outdoors where they feel safe and, and discover things that they've never seen before. So what I wanted to do today is talk about um, the changes uh, that we're seeing around us with some of the most familiar and sometimes unfamiliar wildlife faces. You can see some faces in front of you here. But I also wanted to just really quickly introduce you to um, myself and Long Pasture Wildlife Sanctuary, where I'm speaking from today, and the uh, sanctuaries of Cape Cod. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to our sanctuaries, but Mass Audubon has five sanctuaries <clears throat> open to the public on Cape Cod, including Wellfleet Bay on the Outer Cape, Long Pasture, where I'm speaking from now, Barnstable Great Marsh, Skunknet River and Ashumant Holly. We also have two other more remote uh, barrier beach sanctuaries, Sampson's Island and Papanessa Spit. And each of these sanctuaries has so much to offer at every season. So just because it's January or February doesn't mean there's not a lot to see. And I think this presentation today will give you a little bit of uh, insight into that. But I really hope you have a chance to get out to these trails and take advantage of um, the safety, security, and, and just the beauty and the therapy. I can tell you one thing for me, spending all these times in front of a desk, it's great to be able to, to get out and, and enjoy nature. Um, Long Pasture, one last note, is in the midst of a, a project to build an additional nature center, we're calling our Discovery Center, and it's slated to open in June. And we're hoping by that time we will have at least mostly pass through this pandemic, we hope, right? And that we'll be able to press the reset button and welcome folks into our brand new, all access, uh, up-to-date and professional visitor center at Long Pasture. So Long Pasture is in Barnstable. It's in the village of Kamaquid, right on Route 6A. It's 110 acres overlooking Barnstable Harbor and Sandy Neck Barrier Beach. And it's a spectacular location. Many of you have probably been out to Wellfleet Bay because it's been open for 40 some odd years. Long Pasture, on the other hand, has only been open for um, 15 years. So uh, make your way out here. I know you're out in the outer Mongolia there in Falmouth, but uh, if you can justify driving out to Barnstable and Kamaquid, it's about 30 minutes depending on where you are in Falmouth. So let's get going here. Um, coming to a suburb near you. We're going to talk about some population trends and some impacts and start this off. This is what Sue and I were referring to. See if we can experiment here and do a little uh, Q&A. This is a true or false Q&A, starting with uh, myth or fact. We hear so many calls from our constituents about wildlife and living with wildlife today. And there's a lot of misconceptions. And a lot of what we like to do is provide some facts and information with which you can make good judgment. <laughs> and so let's start off with a fun way to get the juices flowing. True or false, clearing trees from your house will keep bobcats away. True or false, any guesses? <laughs> thumbs down, I can see Kathy, false. thumbs down. False. false. So this is kind of funny. Uh, really quickly, about five years ago, there was an, uh, um, an advertisement in the Cape Cod Times from a landscaping company that was trying to use fear to induce people to, to uh, you know, 
take on their services to clear landscaping. And they were saying, if you clear trees from your house, you'll keep the bobcats away. And I just had to cut that one out. I'm not finding any evidence that that's true. How about this? River otters are impacting our water resources as beavers do on Cape Cod. What do you think? Robin, not so sure. Kathy, maybe. Yeah, thumbs down from Terry. <laughs> thumbs up from Sue. Okay. So river otters uh, are one of these secret creatures, we're going to talk about them, that live here on Cape Cod. Uh, they're not rodents the way that beavers are. They're in a different family, and they don't impact our water resources the way beavers do. Beavers have, a, as you know, a habit of building dams and highly impacting water resources, and they can um, create a lot of tension amongst uh, our human, their human neighbors in other parts of the state, but that's not the case with river otters. How about this? Bird feeders indirectly kill raptors, raptors being birds of prey, like um, sharp-shinned hawks or cooper's hawks. What do you think? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yeah, it's, it's the reaction button at the bottom, if you can find that, if you have it. This is an indirect effect. This is a, sort of a trick question. Yeah, halfway up. <laughs> so bird feeders indirectly kill raptors. They actually do. And the reason, and we're going to get into this as well, is because a lot of birds, especially predatory birds, have learned to be able to use these arrays of bird feeders as um, buffets. They've learned that food sources will be congregated in dense numbers around bird feeders in people's yards. So what do these birds do? They make their way from the tree, swoop down towards the house. They have to go across a road to get to the house, or maybe they have to get through the house, around the house to get to the bird feeders. And many of these raptors see their fate by getting hit by cars during this maneuver, or they uh, hit windows in your homes. So it's been a huge increase in injuries and deaths by car accident and houses. Um, and the uh, Cape Wildlife Center and Wild Care, the rehabilitation <laughs> centers here on the Cape have reported this as an increasing problem. So something to be aware of. These raptors abs absolutely can be injured by being drawn to bird feeders in your neighborhoods. So let's talk a little bit about, now that we got the juices flowing, I'm sure you'll have more questions in relation to those. A little bit about what's going on. So why is it that we're seeing more and more animals? Why is it we're seeing a change in animals in our landscape here on Cape Cod? That picture on the right there of the, of the moose. Well, we haven't had a moose make its way onto Cape Cod that I'm aware of, but we did have a black bear, right? Made his way all the way out to Provincetown. We've seen bobcats now. We've seen many other species. Why is it that these animals are arriving and what can we do about it? How do we coexist? Again, the vast majority of questions we get at Mass Audubon from our residents and our supporters has to do with living with wildlife. So there's two types of reasons primarily why animals disperse. There's active dispersal, which is represented by the moose. This would be um, animals moving due to population pressure. Yeah. Might be due to resources, food resources, or habitat, appropriate habitat resources. It could be competition. A lot of animals have competition within species that they're trying to avoid and they disperse as a result. Habitat quality and size is really important. As animals get squeezed out of their desired habitat, they're forced into other areas. That's what we consider active dispersal. And we're seeing a lot of that here on Cape Cod. We'll talk about it. And then there's passive, which is what you might expect from milkweed pods that blow around using kinetic energy that occurs naturally in the environment. We're not gonna talk about passive today. We're gonna to stick with the active dispersal and really think about it from you know, a philosophical perspective, right? So, so what, what's at play with all of this dispersal that we're seeing with the changes in our environment and the um, constituency of wildlife around us? What's at play, right? So there's this active dispersal, which I was just referring to. And that, again, that's the movement from birth site to breeding site and or from one breeding site to another. That's really the foundation of active dispersal. And we're seeing that with these seals. These are the harbor seals and the gray seals that are now starting to um, populate our shorelines in very large numbers. 
And this leads to, this active dispersal leads to range expansion. That's just a technical um, biological reproductive word for dispersal. Their range is expanding. So the range of the, of the gray seals is expanding dramatically. The range of the Eastern coyote is uh, expanding dramatically and many other species we're gonna talk about. So this is just giving you sort of a little bit of dispersal 101 here. This is also very interesting, the evolution of animal dispersal. So as it says here under this bullet, climate, right? And the ancestral homes of most of our native mammals and birds in part explains their ranges today. And a good example would be this dark-eyed junco that you see here with an insect in its mouth. So think of it this way, our um, seasonal variations that we see right here in New England are analogous to the annual recapitulations of glacial and interglacial periods going back in time. So annual migrations today of this bird here, the junco, reflect these long-term variations in climate and in habitat that took millennia to forge into the migration patterns of the species we see today. And if you think about it, this shouldn't surprise you. Again, something like a junco back in the last glacial period would have been forced to move south from its northern climes because of the glacier, just not enough resources. The animal moved down south. Over a long period of time as the glacier retreated, this species then began to return to its ancestral homes. That habit that took place over the millennia has been forged in the brains the evolutionary brain, so to speak, of these animals and dictates their movement today. So it's just amazing to think that migration is in large part due to the glacial, in, glacially impacted movements of these birds over time. So, so what does it mean now as our climate is starting to shift? We're gonna see what we call phenological impacts. Phenology is the changes around us that take place on an annual basis. Okay, so phenological impacts are gonna change dramatically as our climate shifts because just the slightest temperature change could mean the difference between this junco arriving in time to feast on insects or arriving too late or too early and not therefore not having any insects at all. So again, why do these animals disperse? They may be what we consider to be adaptable generalists. And each of these three species here, usually I ask everyone to name them, but we we'll, I passed that today. Barred owl on the left, and eastern coyote, and, and deer on the right, um, white-tailed deer. These three species are what we consider to be the quintessential adaptable generalists. And that would be completely opposite to the unadaptable specialists. We're going to talk about the difference between the two as we go along. These, are, these generalists are animals that are able to adapt on the fly in very short generational periods to the surroundings around them. And therefore, they're becoming the most successful uh, of wildlife around us. No surprise to any of you, I'm sure. So why else do animals disperse? Well, it's about the fitness. And fitness is a biological word to describe resources. So yes, the, the squirrel in the mouth of, of the fox is very important. To the fox, that squirrel is a resource. And these animals disperse in large part because the resources are available in one location and not another, and they need to move to get to these resources in order to survive. Resources could be food, they could be habitat, the things that we talked about off the top. So there's many reasons why these animals are doing it. People always ask this question, why is it that we're seeing more animals around us? What is it? I thought humans were winning out. <laughs> well, it's not always the case. In some cases, um, these animals are dependent upon us. Okay, so what's at stake? What's at stake in all of this animal distribution that's going on and changes in ranges? Well, you could take this sign literally if you were driving down the road, <laughs> or, or, or maybe not. So the deer population has exploded in and around New England. We're gonna talk about it in a minute. And it may not be a stretch of your imagination to imagine a sign being posted that says, don't veer for deer because we're trying to, to, to manage them and control them, actually hit them when you drive by. <laughs> of course, that's not what the sign means. But the reason why deer have exploded dramatically is because in many cases, we unintentionally are attracting deer into uh, formerly unsuitable habitats for them. 
And that could be, for example, through plantings in your yard. It could be, for example, through feeding deer. Many people, lots of people in my neighborhood like to feed the deer. They like to feed the deer, they like to feed the, the turkeys. And they don't understand that there's unintended consequences of doing so, which could include increasing the deer population's numbers because you're giving them an artificial source of food, which can give them sort of an artificial bump in their fitness, but it can also lead to deer browsing in forests and overbrowsing the understory to the extent where the forest becomes sort of useless or rendered useless for a lot of very important birds, for example, that live in the understory. So when I think about understory birds that live in that shrub layer in the forest, they would be things like a tohi, which is uh, an increasingly rare species, um, brown thrasher, or a whippoorwill. They all rely on that understory. And with the deer doing what this deer is doing in the picture here, destroying that understory, there's no habitat left. So the deer alter the composition and the structure of the forests more than any other species in North America. And many people didn't know that. It's become a pest and it was featured on Time Magazine back in early 2013. Why the rules of hunting are about to change is the title. And this is a, a, a very um, confrontational issue as you can imagine. Bambi's gone nuts. <laughs> so as managers, as, as a wildlife conservationist, organizations like Mass Audubon, Trustees of Reservation, Nature Conservancy, and others, all the land trusts around the Cape that own property, we now have to think about managing wildlife. And in some cases, it could come down to, do we need to hunt? or not to hunt on our properties. And it's just for many people really hard to wrap their heads around the thought that we might be playing God, so to speak, and choosing which animals should live and which shouldn't, for example, or considering the prospect of um, hunting to reduce pest animals. Well, I'll give you some other examples of this as we go along. So as, as managers, we now need to think, how do we responsibly address the issue of overpopulation, particularly as we are the people who work to protect native plants and wildlife, right? It seems to be a little bit of a conflict here. What do we do when wildlife is a threat? So for example, Mass Audubon's Moose Hill Sanctuary in Sharon, Mass has a huge deer problem for the reasons I was describing earlier. They're being attracted to homes and their, their numbers are exploding. And there's also no top predator anymore to control their numbers. So they're going berserk. There are hundred deer per acre. And we're trying to reduce that down to a, a manageable threshold of about 20 deer per acre. And that would require us to take up to 40 deer per year, take meaning to bow hunt. And so um, Mass Audubon has implemented a trial um, pilot project to allow um, deer hunting on the property. And of course, deer are legal to hunt in Massachusetts, but again, here on wildlife sanctuaries, they're considered <laughs> protected, right? So I, I pose these questions, there's no easy answer to them, but I just want you all to be aware that um, this is what's happening. So here we go. Here's another, here's a diversion from deer. Beauty and the Beast. This is a, uh, what? Who, who knows what, what kind of animal this is? Swan, yeah, but is it, what type of swan? So it's actually a mute. Yeah, it's a mute swan. And mute swans are not native to Massachusetts. They're not native to North America. They were introduced from England back in the early 1900s along the Hudson River by estate owners that thought they would like to have an ornamental animal that could populate their, their gorgeous properties. And so what happened is many of these mute swans escaped and started to populate the, the nearby um, rivers and ponds. And ultimately they outcompeted with native wildlife because they simply, uh, well, because the native habit, the native wildlife such as other fowl and Canada geese were not adapted to be able to defend themselves from such a huge bird. This is a, a massive bird with a massive appetite. Like you can see, it consumes eight pounds of vegetation a day and it's hungry. So if you've got a mute swan in a pond with many other waterfowl, the mute swan is gonna push the waterfowl around and it's gotten to the point where in many states they've become an invasive pest that's having real detriment to the native wildlife. I won't dwell on this one, but I just wanted you all to be aware that as beautiful as they are, in many states, these are considered invasive plants and there is active management taking place. Land managers will take eggs from the nests of mute swans and they'll addle them, they shake them, place them back into the nest so that they're uh, unviable. It causes the bird to continue to nest 
without reclutching and laying new eggs. And of course, these eggs never hatch. So um, it's gotten to this point with the mute swans in many locations along the eastern seaboard where management has to, has to um, come into play the way it has with the, the deer. And so as you can imagine, there's a lot of divisiveness that has emanated from the dispersal. And these on the Cape are the three species I think have, have garnered the most uh, interest and concern, right? So we've got the, the uh, seals, which include both the harbor and the gray seals in the upper right-hand corner. The lower left is a picture. This is not a staged photograph. That is actually a great white shark eating a minke whale about three miles north off the coast of Sandy Neck Barrier Beach in Barnstable Harbor. Uh, astounding that a, a shark of that size is that close, but they are. <laughs> and uh, of course, the, the Eastern Coyote. Those are the three I would consider to have the most divisiveness around them from a public perspective. So we call it the Oz and the Jaws. <laughs> oh, isn't that a cute seal? And J Jaws, great white shark in Chatham. The Oz and the Jaws. So, so what are some of the trends around the Oz and the Jaws? This is uh, probably the most uh, contentious issue right now among fishermen and among people uh, here on Cape Cod that like to use the shorelines for recreation. Well, the trends are that the seals uh, are up from about 19 individuals in 1994, that's an estimate, to at least 40,000 in 2017. It's probably anywhere from 40 to 50,000 in our waters today. That's an enormous increase, um, obviously, numerically. And we'll talk a little bit about what it means from a macro scale and a micro scale. And then on the sharks, there are over 200 sharks, which have been tagged since 2009 by Greg Skomel and other researchers around the Shark Conservancy. And the 350 have been cataloged. So 350 great white sharks. And just to remind you, as I go back to the slide here, this, this guy here, who's chowing down on the minke whale, um, was reported to Greg Skomel um, when it was discovered three years ago, and he did not have a record of the shark. So there's still lots of sharks that have not been recorded, including enormous ones, such as this one, which is about 15 foot to 20 foot, he estimated in size, which would be one of the largest great whites he had documented um, ever. So um, yes, yeah, seals attract sharks. We know that to be the case. The seals are primary food for sharks in this region. The sharks have adapted to feeding on these seals. And as the seal numbers have increased, the great white shark numbers have gone hand in hand. So it's gotten to the point where there's a safety issue. We know there's been a death here in Massachusetts from a shark attack. Um, and does culling of sharks make sense? Is this something that we now feel we've gotten to? In Australia, they're doing a lot of active culling along the Gold Coast. They set up um, traps to trap sharks. They set up nets. Um, to trap sharks, and it has been successful. But we have this confrontation now that we're going to need to think about really carefully. So here's some more accusations, we'll call them. And the question is, are these founded or unfounded? Okay, so how about this first one? Seals reduce fish stocks. We get this a lot. The question is, are the seals having a real impact on the fish stocks on Cape Cod? to the point where you can make an argument that we would need to commence some sort of federally sponsored culling. And it depends, the answer is depending on what lens you're looking at and what scale you're looking at. So on the very small local scale, it's quite possible that seals off the coast of, of Tucker Nut and uh, Nantucket are in such numbers that they are having an impact on the fish stocks. But in the North Atlantic, are they having an impact on fish stocks? Not nearly as much as we are. <laughs> How about this one? Seals increase risk for swimmers. Well, absolutely. If you go swimming in an area where there's lots of seals out on the national seashore, you're putting yourself at risk for sharks. It's something to keep in mind when you're going out there, right? Seals pollute the waters. This is a big one. This is very similar to the first bullet. On a very macro scale, it's really not happening. But on a micro scale, sure, uh, lots of seals congested on um, a rocky out bluff, on, again, on Tucker Nut Island or off the coast of Nantucket could have um, local water pollution, water quality um, impacts, but they certainly aren't having anywhere near the impacts that we are um, in the broader ocean. And, and you could argue just the opposite, that they actually, 
their, um, their waste actually has a beneficial role in the microfauna of the, of the ocean, so to speak. Okay, culling sharks using baited drums work. Well, that was what I just brought up. Many parts of uh, the world where great whites and other predatory sharks known to hunt man um, have implemented baited drums, including Australia and South Africa. And there's some thought that this might need to come into play here as the shark numbers continue to increase. And as these sharks continue to understand that seals inhabit shallow waters and therefore they can go to these shallow waters. And of course, we're gonna be there when the sharks arrive. So something to stay tuned for. Removing seals will remove sharks. I'm not even gonna answer that one because I don't think anyone, anyone knows. We have no idea whether they will and how quickly that, um, that remedy would occur if it did at all. And what would be involved in removing seals <laughs> in any way that could have a true impact on the population of sharks in our waters. That would be a massive undertaking. There are plenty of sharks out there, so there's no harm in culling. That's one argument we hear a lot. And again, none of this, there's no right or wrong in any of these. It's really just posing the questions for us to think about. So as far as the seal culls are concerned, a little bit more fact for everybody. The Marine Mammal Protection Act, known as the MMA, implemented in 1972, is just now realizing its successes with gray seals. In other words, the protection afforded back in 1972 has taken two decades to really come through and start to show its positive impacts. This, um, by, by, from a biological perspective, from researchers, the gray seal population is just now coming into its own after having been uh, decimated. Uh, any cull in Massachusetts waters of seals would quickly be replaced by the 400,000 seals that are dispersing from the mothership, if you will, on Sable Island. So as we talk about dispersal, these seals have moved south for resources that we were talking about. They're coming down to our waters. Waters off the coast of Massachusetts are hugely rich in food resources, and very ideal setting for these animals. And so um, it's a feeder. Sable Island is a feeder for the population here. The population in the Cape isn't producing a lot of new pups. It's not a recruitment center. It's a spot that these animals are dispersing to. So that's something to keep in mind when thinking about culling. And then seals, of course, are what we call mesopredators. They, are, they prey and they're preyed upon and they're integral to the food web. We should keep that in mind. When you think about disrupting, um, disrupting the interconnectivity of our ecosystem. A lot of people ask, what's the value of a given species to the greater world, right? What's the value of a toad? Well, we always use that analogy of the rivets in the airplane, right? So if you take one rivet out, you may not have a huge impact, but if you take a bunch of rivets out, you're gonna have a, a large impact. And you could say the same in this case, seals, you know, they're mesopredators, they're, um, they're key in their ecosystem and they're integral to the food web and the unintended consequences of removing them could be great. And you can see that with any, um, any, any um, set of species within their, their organism, within their habitat. All right, so let's change, uh, shift gears a bit here and talk about uh, the most adaptable carnivore. Let's see if I can get this to... Can you all hear that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, okay, great. So that's um, a, a gaggle of pups, I guess, what would you call that, right? Um, a, a bunch of, of, of young pups, and that's the sound that I often hear when I wake up in the morning and listen out over Barnesville Harbor. You can hear um, coyotes that are traveling out on the open marsh, their sound travels long distances, and I often hear that, that sound of a pack of, of coyotes. These animals are amazingly adaptable. We'll tell you a little bit about them. Here's an image that I'm gonna uh, initiate as a video, just to give you a sense to the scale and the size of the Eastern Coyote. It's a very fleeting shot captured on a game camera back in 2011 at our Skunknet Sanctuary in, in Osterville, Centerville area. So that's a, an adult male Eastern Coyote. And if you compare that image to that of a Western coyote, I'll do another video here as I talk, um, you'd notice that the Eastern coyotes are much larger than the Western coyotes. The Western coyotes are the Riley coyote that you think of when you watch Roadrunner. <laughs> the 
Eastern, not so much. They're very different. And I'll explain why. So here's some more um, myth or fact questions for you with, with, um, in relation to coyotes. We get a lot of these questions. Do coyotes kill cats and eat them? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Lots yeah. of yeses. Okay. <laughs> so the answer is yes, they can, but are they evolved to and have they traditionally? No. So if you think about it, uh, carnivores don't eat other carnivores. There's a reason for that. Carnivores eat herbivores. And the reason is because when similar species eat one another, you can run the risk of disease transmission. One, two, you run a big risk of being injured by the thing you're trying to eat. So that's why <laughs> bobcats don't attack coyotes and coyotes aren't attacking fishers. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. It's not that it can't happen. And with people being irresponsible, letting their cats out, especially at night, you would be to blame if your cat dies because it's possible that the cat could run across a coyote and the coyote says, oh, it's fluffy. Great, easy meal, I'm gonna do it and goes ahead and eats them. But are coyotes actively looking for cats to eat? Have they been doing this for millennia and are they evolved to do this? No, they're not. So reduce the likelihood of your cat being eaten by just keeping them inside. <laughs> So coyotes hunt other carnivores, true or false? I just, I just, just dispelled that myth. No, they, they really don't hunt them. They may opportunistically take them out if they're in the right environment and one crosses its path, but no, they're not actively hunting for them. There's a difference. Now, it doesn't mean that these coyotes wouldn't evolve to start eating more and more cats as time goes along. It's quite possible. Um, how about this? Massachusetts has a bag limit for coyote hunting, what do you think? What's a bag limit? A bag limit is a limit on the number that you can harvest in a given year. There is no bag limit. And this was something that was brought to light um, two years ago during that coyote confrontation, coyote debate that the state finally um, levied a decision on. Uh, there was a lot of thought that there should be a bag limit on coyotes because they're essential. They play an essential role in the ecosystem much the way the seals do. But no, there currently is no bag limit. Baiting coyotes is legal in Massachusetts, true or false? What do you think? True. It is true. You can That's bait true. coyotes. It is legal to do so. And that also astounds a lot of people. Shooting coyotes from inside your home is illegal. You think it's illegal or, or legal? I think that's true. Hopefully that's illegal. That. It's actually legal. You can hunt from within your house if there is no other house within 500 uh, feet of yours. That's not a very long distance away. But in the state of Massachusetts, you can hunt. You can also get permission from neighbors within 500 feet to hunt um, from inside your house. So these are kind of archaic old laws that many people believe need to be adjusted. And then how about this? Shooting coyotes will decrease their presence on Cape Cod. Well, there's the answer. False. Yeah, when coyotes are killed, the survivors reproduce at a younger age and have larger litters. And this has been shown to be true by John Way and other researchers here uh, in the Northeast and on Cape Cod. And this is because coyotes have very distinct ranges and they're opportunistic. They'll take the ranges of other coyote packs once those packs disappear. So it's not a, it's not a guarantee that you're gonna decrease the density of coyotes by, um, or the numbers of coyotes by shooting them. You might temporarily decrease the density of them. So here's some more just general information on coyotes, because again, there's a lot of misinformation out there, mostly fueled by fear. <laughs> coyotes are monogamous, usually for several years, okay? Um, they breed from December to March. The pups are born in April. That's when you're most likely to hear those yelping sounds from the pups. It's usually six pups per litter. They're weaned in about six to eight weeks, and they use dens for birthing and rearing. And many of these dens are located on the edges of old abandoned cranberry bogs. So if you live near a cranberry bog, it's not out of the realm of possibility that you'd see a coyote using it. Uh, they begin to forage with the adults that the pups do um, at anywhere from eight to 13 weeks. And the, and the young begin to disperse in the fall, often very widely. These young coyotes that are not paired up yet and haven't bred, they're not of reproductive age, will disperse long and far. 
And on a daily basis, they can easily travel 14 miles or more. Coyotes arrived on the Cape um, from the West, Western states, in the 1970s, having hybridized with wolves. Many people don't realize that. Those that do realize that may not be aware that these same coyotes also hybridized with dogs. Um, and coyotes have adapted to the urban landscape very well. And they've established large territories on Cape Cod. And as a result, their diet has broadened as they've adapted to living in this suburban environment. And you can read all sorts of stories about coyotes in places you would never expect them to be, like Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> downtown Boston. Um, and as I alluded to earlier, the coyotes are probably the most adaptable carnivore that there is in North America. Just the fact that they were able to cross hybridize with wolves and domestic dogs gives you some ideas to how they would have been able to uh, even be positioned to be able to live the way they live amongst us in the suburban environment today, but they, they have. They're just as likely these days to be foraging on a watermelon out of your garden as they are hunting a rabbit in the woods. They're opportunistic. They're opportunistic generalists. This is a really great diagram that shows you, this is by Javier Monzon, who analyzed 437 Eastern coyotes and saw this to be their genetics. 64% is coyote, 13% is gray wolf, 13% is Eastern wolf, and 10% is dog. So, so why dog? Well. If you think about it, uh, a Western coyote making his way across the country over time, generations would have integrated with domestic dogs that are being used to herd cattle, perhaps, or protect homes, you know, and um, they would breed. They're closely enough genetically that they can breed and, and, and um, have fertile offspring. So if you think about a small Western coyote breeding with a German shepherd, what are you going to get? <laughs> You're going to get a big Eastern coyote. So that's the reason why we have coyotes that are this size now. It's that hybridization with wolves and dogs. So big question, everyone asks, are coyotes dangerous? How scared should I be to walk in the woods with my dog, right? So we just say, keep it in perspective. It's really hard to do, you know, because fear and the unknown is a really strong sensation, right? It's like the coronavirus. We were so scared when it broke, we still are. All right, but we have to keep it in perspective for dogs, for coyotes rather, for, there are 4.7 million dog bites per year in the US. There's 800,000 that need medical attention. 1,000 people per day go to the ER. On the other hand, there's only been four to five documented coyote bites in mass history. Two or three were rabid coyotes. So I guess you could argue that would explain why that happened. Um, there are two fatalities in recorded history in North America in the past 500 years from coyotes. So I don't mean to downplay that, you sh that there's no risk. I just think we need to take it into perspective and understand that in relation to things like dog bites and the losses of 1 billion per year, <laughs> the coyote impact is pretty low. So what you can do to protect yourself is when you go out, go out during the day, when you go out, Make a lot of noise like you would if you were, you know, hiking in Yellowstone. Scare those grizzlies away before they come at you. And just be cognizant of what's around you and be responsible. Don't let your dogs and your cats out unattended in places where you know coyotes to be. That's my recommendation. Coyotes and our pets, should we fear, right? So in an urban study analyzing over 1,400 scats, which is feces, right, found, that the most common food items were small rodents, fruits, and deer, and rabbit. Only about 2% of the scats had any human garbage, <laughs> and just 1.3% showed evidence of, of, of cats. Something to keep in mind. So yes, they can, but they don't. So let's talk a little bit about weasels. This is another area that many people don't, don't understand um, the magnitude of. We have a lot of weasels on the Cape, and these are the weasels that we have. We've got the fisher. By the way, if you call it a fisher cat, it's like calling a, a gull a seagull. <laughs> you'll, let the, you'll let the person you're talking to know that you're a rookie if you say a fisher cat. <laughs> say fisher, and then they'll be like, oh, 
you know, you must be a biologist. <laughs> it's called a fissure. Um, and then the ermine, this one in its winter white plumage, so to speak. And then the river otter, not to be confused with the sea otter of the West. The mink, the long-tailed weasel, and formerly the skunk, which has gone through a, a taxonomic reclassification. It's no longer considered a weasel. It's in its own um, family now, a genus rather. It, it is a carnivore, but it's not a weasel. So don't be confused with the skunk. So these are all the weasels of Cape Cod. So what's in a name? Well, um, Mustella, which is the, the genus for the weasel is one who carries off mice. That's the, the name derived from. And weasel means to have a musty smell. And that's, that's a, a ri origin is Sanskrit. These are all forms of the weasel. And if you look at it, you, you notice they all have one thing in common, right? They're, they're long, slender bodies. They also have very short ears and they're extraordinarily flexible, just like a ferret. And so, as you can imagine, these animals are perfectly designed to um, mouse. They get into small places, they're happy and comfortable in small places, and they utilize small places to get what they need, such as this small place, <laughs> which begs the question, how did the weasel cross the road? If a weasel lives in and amongst us, it obviously has to get around these roads, and we're not seeing them very often on the road. Well, in many cases, these weasels get from point A to point B using underground burrows, or in the case of roads, maybe they're using um, these uh, buried um, tunnels. So he didn't, that's how he got across the road. He, he went underneath. And this diagram here shows you a conceivable route that a weasel might take to get through a, a suburban neighborhood. They might go from a patch forest up in the upper left-hand corner and then skip across the road or use a conduit like I just showed you to get under the road and then make its way through this other patch of forest and then maybe cross the road here, the path of least resistance, and then get into another forest um, corridor or patch. And these animals are, like I said, very adaptable and they understand how to stay out of sight. These would be weasels, even things like uh, bobcat and avoid detection. So these little forest patches are really important for wildlife around us to be able to get from point A to point B from way up here to way down here without coming in contact with us or, or running the risk of getting run over. And this is another value for creating forest patches across our country. And the reason why folks like E.O. Wilson are proposing to have a contiguous forest patch that runs from the Arctic all the way down into Mexico through Western, through Western uh, the US in order to provide a safe um, corridor for wildlife travel. So here's another video of a weasel. What kind of weasel is this? That was pretty fleeting, I'll give you another video. A river otter. That's the river otter, yep, you got it Robin. Yep, that's the <laughs> river otter. North American river otter. They're very playful. In the winter months, they use the snowfall as slides. And you can often track otter by going out in the winter months, um, out in the winter months to find them. It's very difficult to see otters in the summertime because they're much more nocturnal in the summer. But starting in February, they begin to become more diurnal, active during the day. And right about now, February into March, is when the otters begin to search for their dens. They begin to pair up. And ultimately, they'll, they'll be looking for um, waterside dens where they raise their pups. Um, otters will always use banks adjacent or in water to raise their young so that they can access these dens via the water for safety purposes. And these photos I just showed you were taken at Skunknet River uh, Sanctuary. I'll do a quick another one for you. That's a bridge that they're on. And again, driving home the point that these otters will use man-made structures to get from point A to point B, they feel they can do so safely. It's not much cuter than a river otter. And it's not much cuter than a fisher as far as I'm concerned. They're cute, but they have a reputation. They definitely have a reputation. I think there's some myths that we can dispel here as well. So let's do a couple other questions. Myth or fact, fishers scream. What do you think? Thumbs up. Yeah? Fishers scream. Okay, let me pose it another way. 
is what you're hearing at night in the backyard, a fisher screaming. Likely a fox. Yeah, exactly. It's likely a fox. If you listen, first of all, try to find evidence of fishers screaming. It's hard to do. You can hear recordings of them online. I know that they vocalize and I know that they make these screams, but the screams that we're hearing and attributing to the fisher are almost always cats or fox. Fox have a blood curdling high pitched scream <laughs> and there are a lot of them around us. If you think about it, why would a fisher who's hunting at night and doing so by creeping up on its prey, why would that animal be screaming out loud? <laughs> Unless it was in a fight. It, it's, it's not going to, a fight with another fisher. So um, just keep that in mind. You know, as a biologist, I'm just naturally skeptical when I get reports of things like fisher screaming in the night. If someone says, you know, I saw a deer yesterday in my backyard, well, I have no reason to doubt it. But if someone says, you know, I, I heard this fisher screaming and I'm positive that's what it was. I like to say, show me evidence. Send me a video of the fisher screaming, not of the sound, because <laughs> that could be anything, but the actual video of the fisher screaming. It's, it's a lot harder to do. How about this? Fisher kill and eat cats. Same question as the coyotes. Same answer. They, they have not evolved to do so. It's not in their best interest. It's too dangerous, but they will opportunistically. Fishers are found all throughout the Cape, true or false. They gotten to that point where they're everywhere now? True. From the bridge all the way out to P-Town? Yep, it's true. They're much more common in the upper and mid Cape, near neck of the woods in Falmouth, but they, um, they have been found and documented as far out as um, East Ham, Truro. So they are everywhere. They're very adaptable and their ranges are expanding. Fishers hunt and kill other fishers and other carnivores. Well, we've dispelled that. No, they do not. They have not evolved to do so, but opportunistically they, they can. This is the historic range. This is pretty amazing. And this is, you know, if you go into the old Encyclopedia Britannica and you take a look at the Fisher range in North America, this is what it would show you. The reality is that it extends way down into Appalachia now or near, near that as, the, as they have become more opportunistic and adapting to living in suburbia. And this is a fisher photographed uh, in upstate New York. And you can see the size. It stuns people when they see the size because there is huge sexual dimorphism in this species. So sexual dimorphism is the difference in size and appearance between the sexes. And this is a male, huge. This, on the other hand, is a female, cute little thing. <laughs> uh, looks more like the size of an otter or a mink. Um, the habitat that fishers, unlike otters, is, um, I'm sorry, the den sites, unlike otters, is, is arboreal, up in the trees. And the, this is an example of a perfect den, a broken, hollowed out tree that the fisher can climb into to raise its pups. They're arboreal. It's very rare that you're going to see a fisher that's um, spending a lot of time on the ground. So here is a video that was taken here on Cape Cod this winter of a fisher. This is really great that I can show you this. Take a look at this. Broad daylight. See his tail wagging. He's about to come down the trunk and you can see the amazing, like a squirrel, the amazing traction and grip that they can achieve with their claws. And look how he runs directly along the trunk using all of its body to support it as it makes its way down. So they're arboreal, they live in the trees, they're mostly nocturnal, but as you can see, they are active during the day. And we think that they're changing their habits in response to living in suburbia, much the way that the coyotes are. Take a look, you'll see some bark fly off the tree in a minute. Right there. Those are long claws. The crow doesn't like it. You can tell the crow's onto them. And there he runs off. So again, that, that looked to me like a female, about the right size. It certainly wasn't this big. Great video, huh? <clears throat> Here's another video of a fisher at the same bridge at Skunknet where we saw the otter. 
So we set up a game camera that winter, left it up for about three weeks. And over that period of time, we caught um, images of fisher, otter, mink, uh, coyote, and several species of duck, <laughs> all using that same spot. Let me uh, get the video running on this. So this fisher was making its way across the bridge and dropped that squirrel. And the game camera captured him picking it up and moving it to the other side of the river. But just like the otter, the fisher uses this, uh, this bridge as a way to get from point A to point B, it's sort of a, a, um, a, um, a corridor. All right, we're making our way through, we're getting there. Let's talk quickly about um, some specialists now. We've been talking about the generalists. We gave you some examples, but the specialist you're all familiar with on the beaches of Cape Cod is the piping plover. And something is known as the crow traversy <laughs> broke out on the outer Cape about the time I started with Mass Audubon, it really escalated in um, 2015. This was an attempt uh, uh, by the National Park Service out in the National Seashore to try to remove the crows, which were predators of piping plovers, by baiting eggs with poison and um, therefore killing any, any crow that got its mouth on the eggs. And this was a sort of a last resort operation that the National Park Service thought they needed to do in order to protect the plovers. But they didn't really calculate the response, the outcry from residents about this idea of playing God that I brought up earlier, whereby, you know, isn't it the case that you're just playing God and you're choosing one species or another? How, how is it that we, you have the right to choose to kill the crows to save the piping plovers? Well, this is a crow with a piping plover in its mouth. <laughs> you can see it here. The piping plovers are a federally protected endangered species. And their numbers are in serious decline because not of us anymore. We're not stepping on them. We're not running them over on beaches when we go out on the beaches, but we're having an indirect impact by shrinking the available nest sites for these piping plovers and creating a buffet, just the way that we were talking about earlier with the buffet that the raptors meet their fate with around bird feeders. And so concentrations of piping plovers are common on beaches so much so that when one coyote or when one crow finds them, they can wipe out the whole beach. And um, coyotes' stomachs have been opened up um, and looked at, and inside them there's 10 to 15 piping plover chicks. Um, so here's a chart that represents the abundance and productivity of piping plovers in Massachusetts. And the yellow line indicates the number of piping plovers that fledged from our beaches on Cape Cod. And the blue line that's going up represents the number of pairs. So you're seeing the number of pairs over time go up. But the number of fledged young is pretty much flatlining. And that just means that we're not getting more recruitment, we call it. We're not getting more chicks being added to the population, chicks that grow up and ultimately reproduce. And so over the long run, that blue scale is going to start to level out unless we take action to prevent the predation of chicks and eggs on our beaches. And this is the challenge. That's what the crow traversy ignited. How do we protect this endangered species from the predators that are now for, uh, feeding on them? And by the way, these predators are the same predators we've been talking about all along. They're the most adaptable opportunists that are making their way around. So here's causes of piping plover nest loss. Uh, 2011, it's still the case today. So that's just as accurate as it was back then. Predation accounts for 50% of the nest loss for piping plovers on a given year on Cape Cod. All the other sources are much smaller. So we now know what we need to do to help protect the plovers. We need to find a way to protect them from predators. So of the predators, well, um, coyote, about 31%. Uh, we've got red fox that have a certain impact. We have a lot of avian impact from American crows we just saw, about equal to the coyote impact. And then lots of others, including uh, um, gulls and uh, raccoons and increasingly weasels. Weasels are smart enough to figure out how to get at uh, diamondback terrapin eggs and finding out how to get to, to plover eggs as well. So we're seeing the number of pests, as you might say, increasing over time, causing more risk. 
Oh, well, quick question because yeah, it's sure. related that I just yeah. saw. How destructive are dogs to piping plover environments? They are a lot because um, as they're making their way around, nosing around, they might accidentally step on piping plover nests. My dog, I can guarantee you, would eat an egg if he found one on the beach. So it's really important to be aware during piping plover season, you know, not only you can't go into those roped off areas, but your pets can't either. So this all comes back to managing wildlife today. And these are the takeaways, okay, from what we've just been talking about. The specialists like the piping plovers are dependent on us. Without our protection, without Mass Audubon doing shorebird protection, other conservation organizations acting on behalf of rare species, these specialists um, will no longer exist. We have uh, an essential role to keep these endangered species um, alive. On the other hand, the generalists, all these other animals we've just been talking about, are taking advantage of us. And you better believe they are. They're very smart. Whether it's a coyote or a raccoon or a crow or a turkey or a deer, they're all taking advantage of us as humans and taking advantage of our environments that we provide them. So we have to understand how to live with the specialists and the generalists and share share our land. So let's talk some happy stories to wrap up. I got two quick ones um, and then we can answer some questions. What time is it now? 2.58, yeah. So um, this is, I'll be quick on this. This is a really fun story about um, barred owls, owls that I showed on the opening slide. Uh, Rob Beauregard has done a study down in uh, the Piedmonts of, of North Carolina looking at um, two groups of barred owls the rural owls that um, live in the woods and the suburban owls. And he was trying to determine if one or the other population is doing better. So traditionally, again, if you go back to the Encyclopedia Britannica, you'd see that barred owls live in the dense deciduous forest. They don't live in the suburban habitats, but this is changing dramatically because these uh, animals are very adaptive. So Rob looked at the trees and the nests that they would nest in both in the rural habitats and in the suburban habitats and noticed that there was no difference between the success of these parents in raising their young in the suburban versus the country nest. They used different types of nests. In the country, they'd use the classic nests up in the tops of trees, but in the suburban environments, the owls were using what they call chimney nests, which are hollowed out areas and large legacy trees that you might find growing on the edge of um, downtown Main Street, right? These are trees that have been maintained for years and have gotten so huge that they begin to hollow out. Well, these birds have adapted to use these nests. And it turns out that they make very good babies in those nests and that the owls have adapted in their hunting strategies in the suburban environments to be successful. And this graph shows you that the urban uh, barred owls rely on birds predominantly, just the way we were talking about earlier with the, the buffet and, the, and the, um, the bird feeders. While as the suburb, the rural birds use um, herps, crayfish, insects as their main diet. So suburban birds figured out how to take advantage of the buffets available to them to provide enough food to their babies and utilize these new types of nests and the chimneys to make do. And these barred owls have done this over a relatively short generational period of time, probably two to three generations. Very similar to the coyotes that have adapted to eating watermelon <laughs> and hanging out in Brooklyn in just a few short uh, generations. And it just kind of tells you how quickly animals can adapt. So look out for barred owls on Cape Cod. We're seeing more and more of them. These are the owls that, that hoot, who cooks for you, right? Who, who, who cooks for you? That's their call. There's a barred owl at Long Pasture we captured uh, a, a great image of. We didn't capture him, we captured a great image of. Um, another uh, success story is that of the turkeys. So here we go. This is a hunt of the past, probably back at the turn of the 19th, 18th century. Look at all these turkeys that these guys caught. Very proud of. There's a coyote in here too. Um, this hunting that took place in the late 18, early 1900s absolutely decimated the turkey population to the point where there were virtually no turkeys in upstate New York and um, they were extirpated from Massachusetts. 
today, the turkeys that you see that are hanging out around the post office and crossing the roads and causing traffic jams are not as wild as you may think. Yes, they are wild, but these are turkeys that were translocated from a captive population that was head started, if you will, in upstate New York starting in the 1950s. So as it says here, by 1851, there were virtually no turkeys in mass at all. And so as a result, New York, upstate New York, chose to begin a game farm that was intended to raise and translocate turkeys across the state to revive the population. And since that time, 1,400 birds have been translocated in the state of New York. The number is up even more than that now. And uh, seven of those birds were moved to Massachusetts as sort of the founding population, the founding stock for the population that we see today. Uh, today, there are about 30,000 turkeys in Massachusetts if you ask for an estimate from Mass Fish and Wildlife. That's quite a, quite a return, isn't it? Uh, it's a revival. Yeah. Pretty amazing. By the way, if you're ever wondering how to sex the two, these red, strange, fleshy protuberances on the necks of the turkeys are called caruncles, and only the males have those. And this is a, a dimorphic feature that's used to attract females. That's how you can tell them apart from the hens. Another great success story, um, we like to end on positive notes, is uh, there's a new breeding bird for Cape Cod. I'm sure many of you heard this. The first a bald eagle nest on Cape Cod since 1905 was documented last summer in Marson's Mills. That's 115 years since the last documented uh, bald eagle nest was, was seen. It just so happens that the last bald eagle nest in Massachusetts prior to their rapid decline was on Cape Cod. That was the last one. And now here we are 115 years later, we are the last region of the state to finally see a successful nest. And it was not only a pair that nested, but a successful fledging. These are the actual chicks from that nest that you're looking at right here. This is an image taken by um, the ornithologists from um, Mass Fish and Wildlife that were alerted to this nest and, and, and scaled the, the tree, huge white pine, and got up to this massive 10 foot, 900 pound nest and um, took images of these chicks. I got lucky enough to paddle by in, um, I guess it was late June, and saw the chicks um, moving about and they successfully fledged. So very exciting. This means that we're gonna be seeing more bald eagles on Cape Cod. This pair will likely come back to the same nest and try again to raise young. Some stats from Massachusetts right there to take a look at. There's 80 nests across the state now. Pretty remarkable, and one on Cape Cod. So the next chapter, as we think about you know all of this dispersal and adaptation and the generalists among us, I think it's fair to say keep your eyes out for more bald eagles for sure. Um, report any nests that you see to Mass Fish and Wildlife. It's not out of the question that the population of bobcat is going to increase. They've been documented. Um, They've been confirmed on Cape Cod. They are among us. We just don't know how many there are. But they're also, although very secretive, they're, they're quite um, formidable and adaptable predators as well. And then, not yet, but I think we're going to soon start to see the porcupine make its way uh, across the bridge. And uh, ultimately, we'll be seeing porcupines on Cape Cod. When? Who knows? So I went a little over, but I'd love to open it up. I can stop yeah. sharing. I've got a few questions that I'll, yeah, read. I'll read them in order that I got Great. them. Um, let's see. What, and let me uh, scroll up a little bit. Uh, what is an, I'm not sure, that might have gotten answered, but what is an approximate territory for coyotes? They have large, large ranges, and the packs can assume uh, 30, 40 square mile ranges um, in certain parts of the state. Here on the Cape, because we're limited in the amount of, you know, habitat, upland habitat we have, they're smaller. But um, there's not much overlap amongst packs, and this is how they separate themselves and avoid competition that we were talking about earlier. You know, there's only so many resources available for the coyotes, and they can't be um, overlapping in size to a large degree. What I can tell you is the coyotes move, individual coyotes, especially males and young uh, individuals, will travel long distances every day. 15, 20 miles isn't out of the question at all. Yeah. 
Okay. Could a lung, um, do osprey eat weasels? Ospreys are primarily eating fish, but in osprey nests, we've seen horseshoe crabs and we've seen turtle shells. Okay. So it's not out of the question. Again, if it's, it's about being opportunistic. These animals will take advantage of what they have available. They may generally eat fish, but they will sometimes eat other things. But I've never heard of them eating a weasel. Okay. Could a long-trailed we long weasel be mistaken for a squirrel? A long yeah, it definitely could. Very similar in size. Yeah. The difference would be that the weasel walks like a... a um, um, a ferret. <laughs> it's got that slinky like movement and bounding, if you will, and has um, um, a longer, more slender body. And it's also larger than a squirrel. Yeah. Okay, a few more. Um, someone just commented that there's an eagle nest in Falmouth. Great. And? Yeah, I know there's one along the Mashpee River. Oh. You know, we're not supposed to be revealing locations. <laughs> But at some, at some point, it's going to be like the osprey. They're going to be out there. We're going to know where they are. The most important thing is, you know, to avoid gawking, to, to voyeurism, to get too close to the to the, the these nests while they're raising their young, because that can have these unintended uh, consequences. It can stress the birds. Too many people taking photographs at too close a distance to eagles could definitely cause the the parents to um, abort the the raising of the young, and that's the last thing we want to see. So. Be respectful for distance. Is there concern for osprey? Anything we humans should or shouldn't yeah, do to help? There was an osprey chapter in this, but I took it out um, because I think um, we, we all know a lot about the ospreys now. Uh, there's not as many myths associated with the ospreys. Um, they've made a huge return just the way that the eagles have. And for the same reason, it's because DDT was eliminated from our environment. And as that chemical washed out of our waterways, it, it ceased being an impact to the fish, which of course the osprey and the eagles eat. So the biggest limitation to the ospreys and the eagles right now is appropriate nest habitat. If they can't find an appropriate nest, then they're not gonna nest. And that's why Cape Cod took so long for the eagles to return. Oh yeah. Now yeah. that they finally have, they're finding suitable nest spots, they're doing so. And, and with our help, with the erection of all of these osprey pools, the ospreys have made their way back. So it didn't matter whether there was no DDT left in the environment. Ospreys were not gonna colonize the Cape until they had appropriate nest sites. And it was really the founding of nest pole raising by um, Gus Ben David out in Martha's Vineyard and um, Alan Poole in the Westport River that, that that whole evolution of raising osprey poles is what really led to the ultimate success of the osprey. And now they're back in huge numbers and they're doing fantastically. It's, it's the best success story we can talk about on Cape Cod. Okay, we've got a few more and just, yeah, stop stop when you run out of time, okay. basically. Nope. There's, about, there's a few more. Okay, do fox nest on marsh islands and then trapped on the mainland by the tides? I'm not sure. Oh, that's an interesting question, yeah. yeah. As sea level rises, what are the impacts on some of these uh, dune swale habitats? upland habitats, you know, I think we're going to see that over time as the sea level rises and has impacts on our salt marshes, we're going to start to see islands being created. And we're going to start to see um, a lot of species that utilize the upper marsh being pushed, pushed back. One species that we talk a lot about when we give our bird presentations is the salt marsh sparrow. This is a species that nests on the ground in salt marshes. Ooh. Right. So they're the most susceptible of any of these birds to sea level rise because they're right on that edge where the sea level is encroaching. And with time, they're going to have to adapt. The question is, are they generalized enough? Are they generalists enough to be able to adapt quickly the way the coyotes have? Or whether they're just specialists like the piping plovers and they're not going to be able to retreat in time. So I don't know the answer about foxes, but I'm sure that there are foxes scattered all around some of these low-lying marsh areas. For sure. oh, yeah. Okay, just two, two more. Um, we saw eagles in the Mashpee River sanctuary several times in the past years. Are they still there? I'm not sure if yes. those are the ones you mentioned. Absolutely. Okay. That was the location that everybody thought, everyone in the know, thought um, that we would document our first eagle nest, successful eagle nest. Yes, there are nests already there, but there hasn't been any evidence that they successfully fledged their young. It ended up being this place in, in uh, Marston's Mills. 
But I'd be willing to bet that in the next two years, there will be a successful eagle nest in the Mashpee, along the Mashpee River. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, and then one more on, it, on seals. Um, I fail to see the disconnect about not cutting, culling seals just so their population would increase again from sable. At what point do we decide that too many are too many? Right, so this is the conundrum that we face and it, it really depends on the scale you're looking at the problem at. Are you looking on the micro scale, the local scale, or are you looking at it on the broader scale, right? That's you know, the same case when you think about wind farms, right? A lot of people feel as though on the micro scale, they're a sore, an eyesore, and they have a lot of impacts but a lot of people more broadly would feel that they're having a, a huge impact, a positive impact on the environment. So it really depends on the lens with which you look at it through. And there is costs and benefits to every management decision that we make. It's not an all or nothing proposition. We're gonna to have to make compromises in how we manage to live with wildlife. And it, it's gonna be interesting to see how the politics work out and how the sentiment works out around the seals and um, the sharks, and it's it's gonna it's gonna escalate, is my prediction, <laughs> yeah. over time. And I don't have the answers. I don't um, specialize in that enough to be able to. But it's a really interesting question. We're all gonna have to think about. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think I got everything in the chat. Uh, yeah. Unless anyone has any quick questions. I wish we could have done this a traditional, you know, more open forum where people can ask questions along the course of the presentation, because I know that there's so many things that come to mind, all of you that spend time outdoors and appreciate wildlife and have a lot of uh, encounters with wildlife. One thing I'll say is if you have questions about wildlife, go to the Mass Audubon website. There's a whole living with wildlife section and so many of the common questions are answered there. We also have a hotline, a Mass Audubon hotline. I'm sitting here in my office. This is an advantage of this, I can actually Tell you the number here if I have it in front of me. Right, I'll type it too. Thought I had it right here. It's on our website, which and is it's called what the is Mass it? Audubon Animal Hotline, and it's the number is 781-259-2150. You can call your local sanctuary, but if you call this number, um, you'll be more likely to get a response. And um, you can get all sorts of information disseminated from that source, but go check out the Mass Audubon website first. Do, do you, what's the URL on that? Do you remember offhand for the site? The URL for it? Yeah. You just go to the Mass Audubon website. Okay. There's search, uh, search. You can just, just Google it. Okay. Living with wildlife. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Pages upon pages of, of answers to the most frequently asked questions. Yeah. I think I've seen that actually. That's oh, good. One. Yeah. Well, I hope this thank was you very fun much. and helpful for everybody to- It has. To yeah, we've gotten a lot of thank yous in the comments. We've oh, appreciated great. it. We, we love having these talks and yeah. I think people have learned a lot. Great. I'm really okay. glad to do it and hopefully we'll be doing it in person soon. Yes, thank you. And thanks everyone for coming. We're, we're glad to have people come to these great. and we want them to be a good thank resource. Thank you, Sue, for, for setting it up. We're very grateful. It takes You're time, welcome. I realize. <laughs> no, glad to do it. Okay. Take care. Have a great day, everybody. All right. Bye -bye. Come by Long Pasture when you guys can. Yes, do. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks.